And welcome back to an episode of the Cool Your Jets podcast where it was Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, we've recovered from the Carolina Panthers loss in week one. You and I are both going to the game this Sunday. It's Patriots week. It's the home opener. Very excited about this one. How are you feeling a few days out? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty great. I kind of had a fear that if the Jets lost the home or the season opener against the Panthers that the home opener kind of have a little bit less juice, but I'm, I'm not feeling that right now. I'm, I'm really excited, mostly because we can feel good about our quarterback. Um, and New England lost as well, so maybe there's a chance they could tie for first place in the AFC East in this game, but, but I'm excited. It's going to be the first uh, home game at MetLife in almost two years. Fans are going to be ready, so um, it's still a really exciting time. And there's a lot to look forward to on the team, even outside of the quarterback, despite – the week one lost, which was only by one score in the end. So uh, I'm, I'm amped up for this game to be there. Yeah, before we get into our preview, let's just take a step back. You've had a chance to rewatch the whole Carolina Panthers game. Generally, when we do the, the recap, it's right after the game has ended and you haven't really had a chance to watch any of the All-22. Do you have any other final takeaways from week one about what were you impressed by and what were you disappointed by? Well, I, I think one big thing that has to be talked about is that uh, obviously, the most scrutinized aspect of the Jets in this game was their pass protection and their run blocking. Um, but I, I think in both of those two areas, yes, the offensive line deserves a lot of blame, but the tight ends, specifically Ryan Griffin, I, I don't want to group them all together all together because Tyler Croft was okay, Trevon Wesco was okay, but Ryan Griffin was killing this team in both phases, both in pass protection. And in the run game, he was whiffing on blocks left and right, could not. Um, even in pass protection, he would double-team guys, whether it was with a running back, with a tackle, and still find a way to get beat and give up pressure. He was a very big part of why you saw defenders constantly in Zach Wilson's face and why the running backs had nowhere to go. So I think that's a huge thing to keep in mind and something the Jets are going to have to figure out how to work around because Griffin played 48% of the snaps in this game. And he started. I, yeah, and he started. He was playing, especially early in the game. He would be in there almost every play except third downs. So it it wasn't until later in the game when the Jets got past heavy that he wasn't playing that much. But early in the game, when they got into a hole, he was out there most of the time. So if he's going to keep playing how he did, it's going to be hard to just you know stick with your usual 12 personnel consistently and just throw him out there for the majority of the game and watch him just whiff on so many blocks. Uh, so it's something that they're going to have to – figure out how to work around if he continues to play like that. But on the positive side, Elijah Vera Tucker, he did have, uh, he did end up leading the team in pressures allowed with six, but all of those or five of those came in the fourth quarter. Four of them came on four straight plays on the last drive of the game where uh, Wilson led them down the field to score their second touchdown. But his run blocking in this game was really good. He was consistently getting it done in, so many different ways, whether it was a hook block on an outside zone, whether it was a combo with Mackay Becton, um, just blocking downhill in power situations, polling. Uh, he had a few good poll blocks. Um, he was really good in the run game. So that's something that I did not notice watching the first time, but he was all over the place in the run game making big plays. So that's something that's really promising going forward. Yeah, and yet the Jets refused to run left all game. Um, but I agree with you. I think Vera Tucker is a rookie who didn't get to play all preseason. You have to wonder the the lingering effects of a pec injury and was still trying to establish any sort of chemistry with his left tackle and his center. Uh, I thought he had an, an okay first game. I don't think he was nearly as bad as people thought. I don't think he was as good as maybe some had hoped, but um, he has 16 more games to prove himself uh, and hopefully a long career after that. I, I think the the one thing you talk about Ryan Griffin – and in general, I think that the Jets got pretty good value for Chris Hernan, especially considering the production that we've seen the last few years. But it does call into question, you know, you knew this was going to be a 12 personnel heavy team. You knew this was going to be it. And I saw you tweet something along these lines, but it's like when when Robert Sala was hired and they brought in Michael Floyd, you knew the tight ends were going to be a big part of this offense. And yet you traded away your, your best pass blocking tight end and arguably a guy who could start for you. I'm not saying he's a world beater, but it's at least, okay, you can put him out there and he's not going to lose games for you. And they didn't really make any moves outside of that. I like Tyler Croft, but you know, you would have liked to see them go after Johnny Smith, maybe a little harder, Hunter Henry or draft somebody 
I mean, the tight ends could really plague this team. It's not like Chan Gailey's offense in 2015 where the Jets can kind of ignore tight end. I know we had talked about that over the summer, but just getting one dose, one week of, of the Jets offense and seeing how much it does look like San Francisco, the Jets are, are going to have to either add a tight end or completely change what they're doing because, yeah, they can't keep running 12 personnel with, with Ryan Griffin and, and on the field. And, you know, if, if somebody goes down, then you're talking about Dan Brown, Tyler Croft to struggle with injuries. So I think, I think they're going to have to make a move at tight end at some point, in my opinion. Yeah, and like I, I still do the Chris Herndon trade every single time, but I can guarantee you that if Chris Herndon were playing Ryan Griffin snaps in this game, the pass protection on – uh, in front of Wilson would have been a lot better because in the same situations, Chris Herndon is not giving up the pressures that Ryan Griffin was giving up because pass blocking is one thing that you can rely on Chris Herndon to do pretty well. So um, again, I still do that trade every time and it's not like Chris Herndon would be amazing in this offense. I mean, you know, he, he's still fairly young and has a chance to turn around, but obviously he's not the greatest player on paper right now. So I still do that trade every single time, but um uh, I don't know. I feel like Herndon would have given them a little bit more blocking capability and pass catching upside um, yeah. than Ryan Griffin would. But, uh, but again, I look, I, I still do that trade, but it more just comes down to the fact that they went throughout through the whole offseason knowing they were going to have two tight ends, two tight ends on the field a lot. And all they did was add Tyler Croft. That, that's really more what the issue is. I don't know if I, I'm as sure. I mean, like, I, I think the trade was definitely good value, but like, let's see, just see how the season plays out because if Ryan Griffin and Dan Brown have played meaningful snaps and they're running the exact same offense that they're trying to run, it's just not going to work. And, and we'll see who they, they take. I think if for what Chris Hernan has produced to this point, you know, especially the last two years, a first, a fourth round pick, you know, recovering the, the, the round he was taken in is great value, but at the end of the day, it is still a fourth round pick. So it's, it's a great from a trade perspective, but if you're getting your rookie quarterback smashed every week, like you said, I mean, the offensive line was bad, but the running back and tight end blocking was even worse. You do have to wonder if it's worth it. But I agree. I think I'm not trying to criticize it because I think it is great value, but I still think the Jets have to make a move. I, I, I thought when they made that trade that they would sign somebody off waivers. And I'm not saying that would change anything dramatically, but Ryan Griffin is not good, at least to this point. He's not been able to capture the, the magic that he had in 2019. And even in 2019, that was as a receiver, not a blocker. And Tyler Croft has missed a ton of games in his career. And we already know Dan Brown's not great. And Trayvon West goes a fullback. So they, I think they have to make a move at tight end at some point. But it's, you know, maybe a week one overreaction. We'll see how the, you know, the next few weeks play out. Uh, before we hop into the Patriots preview, let's go to our sponsor, DraftKings. Week one may be over, but the season's just getting started at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. To kick off week two, DraftKings is giving all new customers a can't-miss offer. Bet just $1 on any football game this week and receive $200 in free bets instantly no matter what. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code COOLYOURJETS to receive $200 in free bets when you place a $1 bet on any football code. That's promo code COOLYOURJETS. All right, Michael, let's talk about this. Um, I guess we can lead off with kind of what we were just talking about and the blocking and the protection of Zach Wilson, because <clears throat> I mean, Jets fans uh, should be pretty familiar with how Bill Belichick plays rookie quarterbacks. And in 2019, Darnold wasn't a rookie, but you know, it was only a second game against Belichick. It was on Monday night football and you just saw Darnold get pants and so the entire offense get pants. I don't expect it to be this rough. Even if the offensive line is really struggling, I don't think it's going to be that bad. Um, because I actually think this scheme has some advantages um, that uh, you'd hope that that uh, over Adam Gase's offense, but we'll get into that a little bit later. From Michael Floor's perspective, how are you calling this game for Zach Wilson? What is the game plan to not get your rookie quarterback destroyed by a team that is amazing at stunts? The Jets sucked at stunts in week one. Amazing at delayed blitzes. The Jets sucked at delayed blitzes in week one. How do you just avoid Zach Wilson from having that seeing ghost moment in the home opener. Well, I think they got to keep the defense a little bit more honest and run some more screens early in this game. They only threw one screen um, in the entire Panthers game, which was uh, the play to Elijah Moore, which was a three yard loss. Um, and obviously when they got down quickly, you can't really do that as much, but in this game, I think early and often they got to try to keep the edge defenders and the corners honest um, and throw some screen passes. Um, run a couple end arounds with Elijah Moore, establish some threats, give the defense some more, uh, give them more stuff to think about. Because again, you look back to that Darnold game, with the Patriots a few years ago, the jets didn't really do that. They kind of just kept, and again, Darnold was absolutely awful. 
Uh, there's no excuse for, you know, the decisions he made under the pressure, but they didn't help him out by trying to, you know, manufacture some offenses, spread the defense out, give them other stuff to think about than just we're going to attack downhill. Our quarterbacks can try and drop back and throw against you. So I think that's going to be important early in the game. Uh, and, and just in general for this offense, I feel like they need to run more jet sweeps, more end arounds, throw more screens to kind of do what they want to do um, and establish the threat of, you know, you know, make the pre-snap motion have a greater effect on the defense by showing the defense that you will run those types of plays. So they have to think about it. And that's something they didn't really do in the Panthers game. Um, you know, the safeties and linebackers were able to just play aggressively downhill. They were coming you know, straight into the box. And that's a big part of the reason the run game wasn't good was because those safeties and linebackers are just charging right into the trenches all game because the Jets didn't establish the threat that those guys had to think about anything else. So I think early in the game, you want to do a few different unique things, specifically with Elijah Moore. And now you've Crowder back as well, who is a much better threat with the ball in his hands than Braxton Berrios. Um, and do some things with those guys to give the New England defenders more on their mind, more different threats that they have to respect um, so they can be more in so the defenders are more indecisive. They're not just charging aggressively straight into the hands of what you're trying to do. Um, so I think that's what they should do early on to um, ease things, ease things up for Zach Wilson a little bit. Well, you hit the nail on the head. The most important thing in this game is the pre-snap motion. And that was kind of, I think the biggest difficulty with Adam Gase's offense in 2019 is that they just didn't use any of it. It was just a very static you know, line up and run um, uh, offense. And I, the Patriots absolutely dominated. I mean, this team is so well coached and so disciplined. You have to try to confuse them. You try to, you have to try to get them out of, out of position because they do so many different stunts and those delayed blitzes. They do a lot of different crazy exotic things uh, and they play a lot of man coverage too, though that pre-snap motion. I mean, you go back and watch the 49ers Patriots game last week. I mean, pretty much every single play, Kyle Shanahan was had Debo Samuel motion, had Brandon Ayuk in motion. So this is Elijah Moore's coming out party in my mind. I think they have to manufacture touches to him early and often. And I think you're right. I think it's Jets. Sweet. I think even I think every single play should have motion. And I don't think the Jets did that. And maybe that's a bit hyperbole, but damn near every play. Because in week one, I just don't feel like the Jets did that enough. I feel like the Jets were a little too static. And it was weird because it was very different than the way they had run it in preseason. I think you need a lot of pre-step motions, a lot of jet sweeps, a lot of different RPOs, you know, motions where you have, you know, maybe Elijah Moore comes, uh, comes in motion, you play action, then you throw it to him. Different things like that. That's going to take the Patriots off their game and you're going to widen out this defense. And then guess what? You can get, uh, you can run up the middle then. I mean, you, you can use your outside zone and your inside zone running attack and run the ball. And I think the other thing is they have to give Zach Wilson some easy throws. And I don't think they did that enough week one either. I think from the get go, you know, in preseason, I think the Giants game is a great example of this. It's like, obviously, it's preseason and it's a different circumstance, but the Jets let him get his feet wet. You know what I mean? They gave him, uh, I think he threw like a two-yard pass to Corey Davis, who ended up getting the first down. They threw uh, to the flat. He threw, you know, he gave him easy routes, so it wasn't third and ten, and he's having to throw a, a fade to Ty Johnson right off the bat. I think they gave him maybe one easy throw right at the start of the game to Tyler Croft, and then that was pretty much it. They didn't really give him any um, – easy throws to get him in rhythm because the one thing that Zach Wilson shows is that he is a rhythmic passer, which is a very important trait. You just got to get him in that rhythm. And once he's in that rhythm, once he's clicking, like he was in the second half, it's going to be a lot easier. And then that, that game breaking, um, you know, improbability will come out, but I think they have to obviously use the pre-snap motion, keep it out of third and long. So by running that football and give him some easy tosses, you know, third and, you know, play action, roll him out, give him some easy throws and get him comfortable. I think those are the biggest things. Cause if he can start to get a rhythm or get, you know, any semblance of, uh, of comfortness against this Bill Belichick defense, uh, it could be a really good day for the jets. But yeah, the, the biggest, the guy who I think is going to have the biggest game uh, is Elijah Moore. And I think when we talk about receivers, this has been a topic all training camp and, and, it's been highlighted this week because Denzel Mims comes into the game at the end of week one, Zach Wilson, by the way, had an amazing throw in that, that play that I think kind of when I noticed how good that throw was, is he takes a shot and finds Denzel Mims for a, for a 40 yard gain. And this is a guy who played like two snaps the entire game. And people are just, you know, wondering why the hell isn't Denzel Mims playing Michael. I know you've talked a lot about this this week. What are your thoughts on the whole Mims situation, especially with Crowder and Keelan Cole coming back? It seems like he's buried on the step track. He might even be behind. He is behind Braxton Berrios. So this is the sixth receiver on this team. 
at times the seventh receiver because Jeff Smith was playing ahead of him. So what are your thoughts on this MIM situation? Is this just – are the Jets downplaying this, or do you think that the Jets should be trying to find a way to get a guy with Mims's skill set a specific role rather than trying to force him to learn – the entire offense until he can get on the field even once because he does have such a lethal skill set. Well, during the game, right after the play happened, I was, you know, leading that pro Mims charge. I tweeted like free Mims. I'd rather see Mims than Barrios and Jeff Smith or whatever. Um, which of course I think we all want. We would all love to see him playing over those over those guys. But I think the thing that we as people on the outside who aren't in the building have to remember is that there's no personal vendetta in the building against Denzel Mims. It's not like they want him to be in this position. I think they all know how much more physically talented he is. They know how much more of a premium investment was made into him compared to these other guys. They know how much more productive he was in college and has proven capable of being in the league as a rookie last year. Um, The GM who drafted him in the second round is still here. So I think Everyone in the building wants him to be playing. I don't think they want this to be happening. There's a good reason that he's not playing, and they haven't made it abundantly clear to us as fans, as people on the outside, even to the media. It hasn't been reported too clearly. Obviously, they've hinted at the playbook and things like that, but it hasn't been made explicitly clear why is he playing so little under, you know, behind guys who are backup fringe players. But for that to be happening, there has to be a good reason for it. And whether we know what that reason is or not, there definitely is a reason. And I, I think that's just the biggest thing. I think people forget that obviously they want him to be playing. And if they thought that he was the, a, one of the players who gave them the best chance at the wide receiver room to win games, if he thought, if they thought they were more confident in him than Jeff Smith or Braxton Barrios, then he would be out there. And we don't know what the reason is. And that's frustrating. But it, that's just how the sport works. They're not going to come out here and tell us the exact reason for every single thing that happened. So um, we'll see what happens. But uh, I think that's the big thing to keep in mind. I think that the other thing that is – I'm torn here because I understand what Saul is saying. Especially, you know, And because we're not in the building, we don't really have in a firm grasp on his grasp of the playbook. And if it is one of those things where – you know, the, the quote that kind of stuck out uh, to me and a few others, I, it was, you know, I saw people on Twitter talking about this and, and Sala had mentioned that in with the return of Keelan Cole and Jameson Crowder, he was kind of gassing them up and talking about what he brings and, and the fact that they're so reliable, they're always there when you need them to be. And for a young quarterback, that's just so important. And I think it was indirectly a shot at Mims that, yeah, he, he there are times where he's run the wrong route and you don't want to put Zach Wilson in a situation where, you know, he thinks Mims is running a, a post and Mims is thinking he, he's running a comeback or something like that. And it's intercepted. And I think the thing that, that Keelan Cole and Jameson Crowder are going to bring is, is reliability with Zach Wilson. I just don't think right. that chemistry with, with Mims is there. Although I will say that the one play against the Panthers is, was, was pretty impressive. I, I want to see Mims in the field because I think he is such a, a great skill set. but I will say this is not unusual. This is not just a Jets thing. I mean, you look at what happened. You look at what's happening with Brandon Ayuk in, in right. San Francisco. Yeah. Kyle Shanahan has is had his a long list of receivers in his doghouse, and I think that you're, you're kind of seeing Michael Floor enact a similar policy with Denzel Mims. It's like you're not going to be on the field unless we are 100% certain that you're not going to mess up these these little details and these little routes because we have a rookie quarterback out there and we can't afford to get him killed. Um, so it's a situation to watch. I do expect him to to start making an impact towards the end of the year. But right now, the hell, there's a chance he's inactive for this game. I would not be completely surprised if he's not even active for this game, which I know will certainly raise eyebrows. But, you know, right now it's the, it's the, uh, it's the Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, Jameson Crowder show with a little Keelan Cole sprinkled in there. And then Denzel Mims, you know, you're hoping by, you know, week six or maybe after the bye that, that he can establish some sort of role in the red zone and, and different personnel packages uh, and then try to have that role grow. But the thing is, is right now he plays Corey Davis's position and that's the position he knows, but Corey Davis is, you know, obviously has amazing chemistry with Zach Wilson. They're not taking him out. They're not going to force Davis to move to a different role. So Denzel Mims, you better learn how to play the Z or you better learn to become a big slot because until that you're not going to get in unless Corey Davis goes down. All right. right. A little... and, and I, I just think that I, I feel like sometimes we forget that 
these players are still doing work and like they still exist when they're not on the field because I feel like fans say we deserve to see Mims on the field getting a chance and things like that. But they're watching him practice. They're watching him watch film, take in the playbook and, you know, prepare every single day. So, you know, the people who are making decisions, calling the plays are with him every single day. So even though we don't see it there, the team is seeing from him what they need to see to determine whether he's worthy of playing. So it's just frustrating for us because we all love to see him playing because we know how talented he is. But, um, you know, the most important, you have to perform in the film room, uh, on the playbook, on the practice field to get out there. And uh, obviously he's not doing that for one reason or another. So I think uh, it's frustrating, but it is what it is. But I will say, I don't think the Jets should be afraid to, to give him some sort of, of role, especially in the red zone. I think that's the, the you know, we didn't really get to see the Jets in the red zone really at all uh, in this game. So maybe that is kind of his role right now. But he's too talented to keep off the field entirely. I do, I agree with everything we've been saying. But once the Jets are inside the 10 yard line, I think Denzel Mim should be out there because he's such a good run blocker and because, you know, fade routes, anything in the back of the end zone, that's a guy that you want in there. So, um, I think that they can start to work on a package like that for him. And then hopefully the rest of the game comes after that. Uh, I guess just lastly on the offense, before we, we talk about some of the stuff on, on the defensive side of the ball and then some matchups and our, our prediction, we talked about it a little bit with the, the O line, but these Patriot stunts and these delayed blitzes, I mean, are you, how confident I guess are you in this offensive line that they can rebound, especially with Nomakai Becton, George Fant sliding over to left tackle. I mean, or do you think this is going to be another shit show or do you think this is another, you know, one of those things where week one was a lack of chemistry. Week two should get better. Week three, even better. So on and so forth. I know you were concerned about the running backs and tight ends. Let's take them out of the picture for a little bit. Let's talk about the offensive line because they're going to have to keep up Zach Wilson. Uh, they're going to have to keep Zach Wilson upright if they want any chance of winning this game. Well, I guess we'll see if, if it's a sign of things to come or something that will improve because, um, you know, it was a pro- these types of things were problems last year and it continued this year. And uh, four of the five starters who were there last season were here in this Panthers game. So the excuse of continuity isn't really there anymore. Obviously, Vera Tucker didn't play in any of the preseason games and he's a rookie, but – um, Connor McGovern, Greg Van Roten, they played next to each other. Van Roten played next to Fant. So uh, that excuse isn't really there anymore. So we'll see if with some more time it gets better. But um, this is a team that's going to test that out just as much as the Panthers did. Um, and obviously we know that from the years of watching them. So um, I'm starting to put the spotlight on Connor McGovern because last year he struggled with these things. He run blocked really well. Uh, his pass protection improved in the second half, but – uh, the blitz pickups and the stunts were the reason that he ended up as one of the centers who end, uh, allowed some of the most pressures in the league. Which is and good so, because he was, which is weird because he was good at that in Denver. Right. Which is really odd. And that's why I thought he would have a good chance of turning it around this year. But, you know, one game in, we saw a lot of the same struggles. So um, it, it's time to start putting the spotlight on him and expecting him to get better because, you know, for one season, all right, hopefully he improves, but. Uh, now it's time to start seeing it. And um, same thing goes for Van Roten, who I think is capable of being less atrocious than he was in his first game. He's not hes not good, but I think he can be low average, um, which he wasn't in this game. So we'll see what happens. But the Patriots are going to test all the greatest issues that plagued them this Panthers game, which is good and bad because at least they saw these types of things last week and are a little bit more prepared for it. Um, but we're going to learn a lot about who this offensive line is, especially without that. Yeah. I, I think that the other thing with this offensive line is that this is Joe Douglas's handpicked mm-hmm. offensive line. And I shouldn't say handpicked in the sense that this is his dream offensive line that they, that, that, that he thought was going to carry the jets, to the super bowl, but this is the first time that, okay, all five guys in this offensive line were brought in by Joe Douglas in, in not just bums that he kind of, I mean, these two first round draft picks, obviously back going to be out for the next you know, two months or so. Um, Connor McGovern was a relatively high price free agent. And same with George Fant. I mean, George Fant, they had the out on. Greg Van Roten is really the only one that was kind of a low budget free agent that they brought in. But then still the criticism can be, well, why didn't you add somebody else? I'll be a free agent to the draft because they had plenty of opportunities to, you know, to get more aggressive on the offensive line outside of just bringing Elijah Very Tucker. I mean, this, this was a team that seemed very adamant to keep Connor McGovern in that center role, not try to slide him over to right guard. 
due to his contract, it seemed pretty obvious that he was going to be here. But the fact that they were adamant to keep him at center, they didn't try to replace Greg Van Roten. I think right tackle bringing in, you know, a fan is just such a great scheme fit, even if he's not going to play well. And Moses, I thought was a good signing. So I'm not going to really hate too much in the right tackle, but replacing Van Roten and the use of, of McGovern, you know, not investigating on like a guy like Corey Lindsley or some of the great centers that were available or, you know, going after a guard on, you know, day three of the draft or something like that. How much should the pressure be turned up on Joe Douglas for his offensive line? Obviously we were aware this is still rebuilding. He's still got a bunch of, of capital next off season to really get this team in the right position. But I think this is kind of the, the first time you can really put some heat on Joe Douglas to say, Hey, week one, you're going to get your quarterback killed. You're going to get your franchise quarterback killed. If that's your offensive line plays week in week out. Yeah. I think it's definitely time to, um, to where we can start validly criticizing a few different aspects of this offensive line, um, specifically from center um, to the right. Um, like I said, with McGovern, it's time to start criticizing him if he doesn't pick it up and continues to be one of the top centers on the leaderboard for pressures allowed. Um, and then a right tackle, George Fant, you know, he took a gamble on him, paid him like a top tier starting right tackle, even though he was a backup because he thought he had, uh, Douglas did thought that Fant had the talent to improve to that level. And there have been flashes, and he's a good scheme fit, but that production hasn't quite been there. And he's, you know, frankly, not a good value right now. Um, so those two signings in particular, you know, we're in year two. They're still starting, and they're making good money. So it's definitely time to criticize, especially since Fant was chosen over the more durable, more accomplished Morgan Moses um, to be the starting right tackle. So those two guys in particular are plenty – of criticism there obviously with bear tucker he's a rookie he can do whatever this year and it's fine you you well, only plays well, not whatever but, but. I, I i mean and I, I mean i guess trading up for him definitely changes that a little bit but you know he's still a rookie so um there are plenty of offensive linemen who've been really bad as rookies and then turned it around and been good so i guess that's more what i was getting at because um we've seen that with a few different offensive linemen in recent years but um you know he's a rookie so obviously we can be patient with him but um, specifically McGovern and Fant, it's uh, time for those guys to start picking it up because Douglas bet on them to be starters for his new franchise quarterback, uh, and they got to start playing like they're worthy of that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the defense because I think one of the most intriguing things about this matchup is it's not Tom Brady against a Jets rookie quarterback. It's a rookie versus a rookie matchup. And a rookie who had a very good week one and did pretty much exactly what was asked of him had a ridiculously high completion percentage, but was dinking and dunking. You know, you, I think the thing with Mac Jones is he might not have the others, the ceiling of some guys like Zach Wilson or Trevor Lawrence or Trey Lance, but you were pretty confident that his floor was going to be pretty high. And in this Josh McDaniels, Bell Belichick system, he seemed like a, a, a perfect fit. How do you, what do you think the Jets answer is for, for Mac Jones is dinking and dunking? We talk a lot about Bill Belichick making Zach Wilson's night or day a nightmare, how can Robert Saul and Jeff Ulbrich do the same to Mac Jones? Well, I think the biggest key is doing exactly what they did last week, and that is tackling really well underneath, not even necessarily a schematic thing. It's just against the Panthers last week, the Jets tack tackled really well. They made tackles in the open field, in the flat, um, and didn't let good plays or become great plays or decent plays become good plays. And I think if they can continue doing that, then they should be in good shape because the Patriots are going to throw the ball to their running backs a lot, give those guys chances to make plays. They're going to throw the ball to tight ends over the middle. Uh, and you just got to finish those tackles and keep a five-yard pass through the air to a five-yard gain and not let a guy break a tackle, make it 20 yards. Uh, and that's, what they, that's one of the things they did well defensively last week. So um, specifically in the secondary, um, corner, Eccles, Gidry made some great hits. Um, mostly made some good plays of his own. So um, as long as they uh, continue tackling uh, the way they did last week, which isn't guaranteed that they'll continue to do that, but if they can, it's the same what they did last week in terms of tackling. Uh, it should be a big – one of the strengths of this defense throughout the year, and it, it's huge against a team like New England that um, likes to give the ball to its playmakers underneath. Yeah, I think the biggest thing – for this this Jets defense to have any sort of success is going to be in the linebacker group, which you're confident about C.J. Mosley. Hamza was up and down, but as you'd expect for a rookie. And then the Jets are going to have somebody else in there. That's not Jamie Sherwood. 
we'll see whether or not they slide Mosley back to the mic or whoever they put there. Obviously they signed BJ Goodson this week, but like you said, I mean, tackling is going to be huge, stopping the run, covering the running backs in the passing game, which is something that has killed the jets. Every time they played the Patriots is they cannot seem to cover the running backs in the passing game. So there's going to be a lot of pressure put on these, on these linebackers. And I think you're going to have to accept that the, the Mac Jones in this offense is going to move the football. I mean, th- I think this, the way the jets win, it's the way the dolphins won last week is they're going to have to play Ben, but not, but don't break defense. I mean, they're going to have to, you know, you hopefully you'd like to stop them, but if, if the Patriots move the ball and the jets hold in the red zone, you hold them to three. Um, I think that's a win for the jets. If they can keep holding this offense to field goals, I think you're, you're okay with it. I think the jets are going to, to squat and play underneath and, and force Mac Jones um, to try to beat him deep because he hasn't really proven he can do that yet. Um, but in general, it's just going to try to keep everything, you know, to, to try to limit the, the big plays, I guess, from, from uh, a run after the catch standpoint, I think you can play underneath and, and worry about Mac Jones trying to hit you over the top. Um, but I think the big plays are going to come from new England is if the jets miss these tackles, you know, on those running back wheel routes or to one of those big two tight ends. I think that's what the jets have to do. If they can tackle well, uh, I think they can get a little bit more aggressive in their coverage. And I think the jets are going to be in good shape. And as far as holding this offense to, to field goals, you know, the thing that kind of always stood out to me about when the jets played the 49ers last year about Robert Sala's defense is, you know, it, it, I think you and I both agree that might've been Sam Donald's best game of the season. Um, and it was a very much a dink and dunk approach, but the Jets kept getting stifled in right outside of field goal range or inside of field goal range. And the Jets got blown out. I mean, that's just how this, this Niners defense operate is they're tough to score against. You can kind of dink and dunk. So I do expect to see Mac Jones have another nice high completion percentage day. Um, but it's going to be the tackling. That's going to be big. And we'll see how aggressive they do get as far as playing underneath or throwing these exotic looks at Mac Jones blitzing because the jets are so young. I think that they want to stay away from too many exotic looks. They don't, you know, now, especially with, with Marcus Joyner out um, a lot of youth, um, especially in the back two levels of this defense. So I don't think they were going to do anything crazy from a rotation, you know, standpoint, but maybe they'll get a little crazy with the stunts and the blitzes they throw. The Patriots did give up nine pressure or not nine QB hits week one. Um, so we'll see. And I, th- I think the other thing is if this Jets defense can create at least one turnover, I think they're in very, very good shape in this game. I think if the Jets get a turnover, the, the probability that they win this game uh, goes up tremendously. Uh, what, uh, what are your biggest concerns about this defense? I mean, if you do sit back and you're thinking that after this game that the Patriots won, what is going to be the story of, of why uh, this defense failed them? Yeah, well, I think just to go back to what you just said, I think the tackling is really important because um, – if they're not going to make tackles underneath then, because like you said, I think this defense is built to kind of be a bend don't break unit, especially, um, you know, with your star pass rusher, Carl Lawson out for the season. I think um, that's what this defense is going to try to do. They're going to play conservatively in the back end. They're going to let the pass rushers um, play really aggressively and, you know, try to convince teams to play the way the Panthers did last week. Um, And as much as the Panthers moved the ball and as many mistakes as the Jets made, they only scored 19 points because the Jets were able to make big plays when they needed to in the red zone. Um, So I think that's going to be their strategy this year. And if they can play even better than they did against the Panthers last week, you know, which you would hope that they would, because even though they only gave up the 19, they played, you know, I I think most people would agree they didn't play their best game defensively. Um, So if they could do even better avoiding those big play mistakes in the secondary Um, like the big touchdown to Robbie and a couple of the other plays they made through the air um, and then rely on their tackling underneath, um, then I think they could be successful. So if they lose, I think that it's going to be because they're missing tackles, you know, not finishing it the way they were against the Panthers. Um, But I'm also kind of, I'm a little intimidated by Mac Jones deep ball. Not not intimidated. I think that, that he's shown that it could be a weapon for him this year as a rookie. He's, I think he's thrown some nice deep balls. And so that's something that, I'm afraid of, especially with these, um, you know, new safeties back there who have just joined the team, whether it's Sheldrick Redwine, who gave up the Robbie touchdown, Gerard Wilson, who they just promoted to the active roster. Um, The Jets are relying on a lot of guys they just brought in to play the position that has the most, the position where if you mess up, it has the biggest negative impact uh, out of any position on defense. So it's, um, it's a really tight, you know, dangerous tight rope to walk. And we saw that last week with Redwine giving up the biggest play of the game. Um, the Jets are still going to be doing that this week with him and a few other guys. So 
Um, I, I think those are the two biggest things. Can you finish your tackles against um, Damian Harris and James White, John Smith, Hunter Henry? Can you finish your tackles against those guys? Um, and then in the back end, can these um, inexperienced new safeties and these young cornerbacks avoid making that one big mistake that allows Mac Jones to hit that one big deep ball? So you think that the, the Jets are not going to, to be kind of aggressive in their coverage playing underneath you? Do you think that they're going to kind of stay in their base? Uh, they're, they're not going to adjust too much and just accept death by a thousand paper cuts. Cause that's what I'm kind of balancing. It's like, well, uh, you can get aggressive because he hasn't really hit you over the top. But at the same point, it does, it does it contradict with what I was saying earlier, where it's like, look, as long as you hold in the red zone, you can accept the death by a thousand paper cuts. How do you think Robert Saul and Jeff Holbrook play it? Keeping in mind that this is a rookie quarterback and it's a guy who I think, what was his third play of the game through a backwards pass spike. I mean, like this is a rookie quarterback who's, who's not a 10 year veteran. He can get flustered. Um, especially maybe if you're taking away that dink and dunk offense, maybe you throw him out of rhythm. I think that's a good point you make, but I, I mean, it does say a lot about Mac Jones, the fact that we are sitting here kind of considering two different ways he can beat you. We know that he will dink and dunk the ball in a safe, efficient way, um, but also that he can throw the deep ball as well. So um, it, it's not necessarily pick your poison because he hasn't proven that he could do either one at high level yet, but um, he's impressed for a quarterback this early in his career. I think he and Wilson have objectively between the preseason and week one, been the two best rookie quarterbacks but uh but i agree with you i think on the road that's another key aspect um this is going to be his first road start it's you know one of the most packed stadiums in the nfl um and i think you know giving him some pressure looks could really exploit that in his first start on the road make him have to you know set protection some more change things prior to the snap um, and deal with that in a road environment. So um, I actually think that is what they'll do. I think they will be a little more aggressive blitzing than they were last week right. against the Panthers. And especially with, you know, Jamie and Sherwood's going to be out, probably BJ, uh, BJ Goodson's going to be starting at linebacker. You're going to have, um, you know, another new player in there, you know, try to mitigate that by instead of asking your linebackers to cover so much, blitz them a little bit more, just send them after the quarterback. So I do think that they are actually going to play that way a little bit more aggressively bringing their linebackers some more. Um, and, you know, it, it's going to be high risk, high reward. If it works, they could absolutely smother Mac Jones. He can make some big mistakes and they could really shut them down. But if Jones is going to hit those deep balls, if the young cornerbacks aren't going to hold up against um, Nelson Aguilar, Jacoby Myers, um, if the safeties are going to make mistakes, I think he is capable of punishing them for playing that way. But at least you can start out playing that way and adjust. I think right. that will be the approach. Well, the thing you just said, it's like these Patriots receivers are not scary. I mean, their tight ends are scary. Their offensive line is scary. Their coaching is scary. Their defense, but like the receivers are not the strength of this team. And the Jets' corners actually played relatively okay week one. You know, I, I would yeah. venture to say good, but you know, obviously there's uh, they can clean up anything. But I thought that Bryce Hall did a nice job. I thought that the slot corner Mike Mike Carter had some good plays. Javon Gidry had some good plays. So. The thing with this this team is it's going to be, can they stop the passing game to the running backs and can they stop the passing game to the tight ends? And so it's kind of the Jets linebackers versus the Pats running backs and the Jets safeties versus the Pats tight ends. And I think that is really going to decide this matchup from a Jets defensive standpoint. Maybe maybe we get a Mac Jones, Zach Wilson shootout, but if the Jets are losing both those matchups, they have no chance of winning. If they can hold on one of those, if they can hold the tight ends, you you'll take, I guess the passes to the running backs, or if they can hold the pass to the running backs and it's just the, the tight ends versus the safeties, the jets might have a chance, but if they lose both those matchups, I think it's over. I think it's over. Uh, what do you think about that matchup? And what are some of the other matchups in this game that you're looking forward to watching? Yeah. And I think on the offensive side, there are some interesting matchups um, specifically the jets receivers against um, new England's corners without Stefan Gilmore. They, New England's known for being a man-to-man -man team and having great cornerback play, but without Stephon Gilmore, they haven't been as great. J.C. Jackson has been a, a great cornerback for the Patriots the past few years, um, but in the five games he played without Stephon Gilmore last year, he, aver he allowed about 70 yards a game and four touchdowns in five games, two of those coming against the Jets in that Monday night game where Joe Flacco torched them. So I, I think that's something worth keeping in mind, that this defense, these corners especially, are not as dangerous without Stephon Gilmore out there and haven't been able to respond 
uh, without him healthy. So I think that's a matchup to keep in mind. Um, and like you said, I think this is going to be Elijah Moore's game to shine. I think, you know, New England's going to try to do what I think the Jets will try to do. Blitz heavy on Zach Wilson, put pressure on him, uh, and rely on their man-to-man matchups outside, specifically with the focus on stopping Corey Davis. So that opens the door for Elijah Moore. I think that he's going to have favorable matchups, one-on-ones, and man coverage. And you look at Moore's film last week, for a guy who put up negative three yards, he was open a lot. And obviously he dropped a big touchdown, but he was open for that play. Later in the game, Wilson underthrew him on a deep ball while he got pressured. But again, he was open enough for that throw to be attempted, and it could have been completed if the pressure weren't there. And then throughout the game, there were plenty of plays where Elijah Moore was open and either the pressure prevented Wilson from having the time or the angle to get it to him, or Wilson just attempted a a better, deeper throw to someone who was open at a further level down the field. So he was open a lot in this Panthers game. Um, So in a game where, you know, the Patriots project to play a lot of man coverage as they usually do and blitz a lot and force the quarterback to try to find those matchups. I think this is a favorable matchup for him. Um, and, then, and then there's one other aspect of New England's defense that I'm looking at. And you kind of brought it up earlier, how um, the motion and running and just establishing that the, the threat of an outside offense screens and motion and sweeps and stuff can sort of open up the interior run game. And that's a great point, especially in this game against New England, because their interior run defense was a weakness against the Dolphins in week one. Uh, Miami had a lot of success running out the middle on the Patriots, almost five yards a carry. Um, they converted on their short yardage plays up the middle. So I think that's a weakness of this Pats defense. Their interior defensive linemen were among the worst graded against the run in the league in week one. So I think that um, the Jets can have some success running up the middle against this team. And we think of the Jets as an outside running team, and they primarily are. But in this Panthers game, they ran a lot of stuff on the inside, a lot of gap blocking concepts, a lot of poles on the inside. Um, so there's a good mix of there's a good variety with the way that the Jets run the ball. And I think they can be successful running up the middle against this Patriots team. Absolutely. If the Jets can establish any sort of ground game and take some pressure off Zach Wilson, that's going to be absolutely massive. And like you said, I think they are going to play a lot of man coverage and that's why the motion really works against this defense is it's, it's a lot easier when a defense is in or it's a lot, I guess, harder when, when a defense is in zone to try to exploit those easy, quick matchups, those easy, um, completions, but when a team is in man, the guy has to follow or, or track a receiver or tight end across the formation. It, it does create some mismatches, not only for the guy in motion, but some of the things you can do off of it, whether it's running the football or throwing it to the other side, it opens up things, especially against this defense. And then, like you said, if you widen out this defense, you can run it up in the middle and attack the rush D. I actually think this is going to be a good game for the jets. Um, I, you know, I, obviously you and I both had them winning last week. I think maybe that was, uh, you know, I'll stand by. I thought I thought the Jets should have been uh, more competitive. And look, if Elijah Moore catches that 50-yard bomb at the start of the game, who knows? Maybe the Jets do win this game uh, or win that game. I, the, the second half looked a lot more like I thought the Jets would play. But, you know, whatever. That's in the past. I don't want this to seem like we're going to pick the Jets to win every week because I have them actually losing the next two weeks. So if they lose this one. If like, they burn us this week, I think we're both going to dial back a little bit. Well, I, I, I'll, put this I'll put it this way. Even, even if they win this game, I still – well – Things change, so I, maybe I shouldn't put this put this out there. But I was going to say, I don't have the Jets beating the Broncos, and I don't. Yeah, have the Jets I'm probably the not Titans. picking them to beat Denver. That's for sure. I don't have them beating the Titans either. So if they lose this game, it could be an 0 4 start. But that's here, neither here nor there right now. I, I think when you talk about the the Patriots corners versus the Jets receivers, I think that's such an important matchup because with Gilmore out, you know, and the Patriots have done this thing for a while where they double the best receiver. So you'd imagine that would be Corey Davis, and then they'll put their best corner. Uh, on the Jets' second option. And that seems to have stifled a lot of uh, a lot of young quarterbacks. But I really do think the Jets' wide receivers could end up winning this game for them because they're so deep and because I'm confident in them beating man coverage. And I like Zach Wilson as a quarterback against man coverage because of his accuracy and his ability to create things off script. He's good at those back shoulder balls. He's good at the at throwing in rhythm. Uh, obviously, you know, like you like he's good against zone and, and whatnot. That man coverage, especially with receivers he has that chemistry with, like Corey Davis, or you'd like to see like Elijah Moore, I do think the Jets have a good chance to have a good offense in this game. I mean, the, the biggest thing is going to be, can they give him any sort of time? Because even if even if he's under pressure all day, 
and the Patriots are shutting the house, I still think there's a chance for them to, to get that quick uh, passing game and rhythm, which I think they will try to do right off the bat. You can do use motions. You can throw screens. You can throw quick passes. You can throw it to the guy in motion. You can get a rhythm going for him, establish a run game, get the play action game going, and then take your shots. I think that's kind of what the game plan is going to look like. But even if he's under pressure all day, um, if he can get, if he has just enough time to get the ball out, I think, I think they're, you know, they're in a good position. My biggest concern for this, for this game, and maybe this is misguided considering how Bill Belichick has played rookie quarterback, but my biggest concern is the Jets defense against the Patriots offense. If they can hold in the red zone, I'm feeling good, but because the running backs and the, the tight ends are such strengths for the Jets, it, it worries me. So as far as my prediction, Michael, well, here's what we'll do. Before we get into the score prediction, I want one, and you, you messed this up last week, so let's get this down for the next 16 right. weeks. Right, I we want got one it. prediction about the game, and then we're going to get into the score predictions after that. So one prediction about the game, it could be a stat line, it can be uh, an individual player performance, it can be any, it could be at the uniform, it could be anything about the game, about the crowd, whatever it is, one prediction about the game itself. You shouldn't bring up uniforms, because you know whenever you bring it up, we're going to go on a 10-minute tangent about that, but... I'll go, I'll go with the real prediction. I'll go with Elijah Moore. He's going to put up at least six catches, 80 yards, and he will score. I, I like that. I mean, I'm definitely on board with that one. I, I, because I think this is the Elijah Moore coming out party. Because week one was so disappointing, um, I think people are going to be relatively surprised with how, how involved he is in this game. I think they have to do a better job of manufacturing those touches. But because the motion is going to open up a lot of things, Elijah Moore is going to be that guy this week. I think they're really going to try to get him involved. And, and once, if he starts to have a good game, especially right off the bat in the first quarter, that's going to take some pressure off Corey Davis. And then, you know, maybe Zach Wilson can connect with him. Well, I was going to make an Elijah Moore prediction. So you've kind of stifled me. Clearly the Jets will be in all white. You can kind of, you can always tell by the way, by the practice uniform they wear. If the offense is wearing green, they're wearing green on Sunday. If the offense is wearing white, they're wearing white. It gets messed up with the black uniforms, but they're wearing white. It's a wide out home opener. I'm very excited. I haven't been to a Jets game since the seeing ghost game. We'll see if I'm a curse or not. Um, I tend to, you know, the last, I've only been to three other Jets games. One was 2012 at Seattle, Jets lost. One was 2016 hosting the Patriots. That was actually a good game. That was a pretty fun game, even though the Jets blew it in the end. That was the Quincy Inunua butt touchdown. And then the most recent one was the, uh, was the uh, 2019 seeing ghost game. I actually had a ticket to go to the 2018 home game against the Patriots. I, this is the, I guess I always choose the Patriots matchup because, you know, as a kid, that's my least favorite team. Uh, but then when Darnold got hurt, we, we didn't end up going. We sold those tickets. So I'm excited. This is game number four, only the third home game I've ever, ever been to. Maybe they can get a win. As far as predictions go, though, I'm going to say the Jets do get a turnover on Mac Jones. And I think that's going to blow the roof off this place. I think the Jets are going to get a first half turnover on Mac Jones. Um, an interception by mm, I can go Marcus May. I'm gonna say Marcus May picks okay. him off. I'm gonna say Marcus May gets a pick on Mac Jones, and that's gonna to get the crowd into it. Um, but offensively, I think the Jets are gonna have a good day. I think this offense is gonna look completely different. Maybe I shouldn't say completely different, but it's gonna look a lot different than Week One. I think you're gonna see a hell of a lot more motion. I think you're gonna see a, a much better game plan um, because I think the Jets got a little too cute trying to attack Carolina's strengths. Uh, instead of just playing within themselves. And luckily for the Jets in this game, what the Jets' strengths are or what the Patriots' weaknesses are. So with the Jets' offense versus the, uh, the Patriots' defense. So I like this matchup. I do have the Jets winning. As far as the score that it goes, though, Michael, I, I, I kind of do feel like both offenses will have some success. I, I don't know what I'm going to go. Maybe 21-17 Jets. Do you like that? I, no, I was no. going to go 21-20 Jets. 21-20 Jets versus 21-17 Jets. I kind of feel like Matt Amendola might get some love in this game, though. So, hmm. Hopefully he still remembers how to kick. That's true. They could have completely messed him up now. I'll, you know, I'll stick 21-17 I'll stick Jets and that he only kicks uh, extra points. Three touchdowns for the Jets. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this game, Michael. I'm feeling good about it. Um, but, alas, we'll see, uh, we'll see Sunday night how they do. All right, let's get out of here. Michael, um, before we get to your last thought, think of it while I do the plugs. Follow us at CYJ at Pod on Twitter. Michael at Michael underscore Nanny. Myself at Ben W. Blessington. Go to JetsXFactor.com for the best place to go for Jets content. Rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. And Michael, final word. 
all white is going to look really good in the this early. It looked great in that 49ers game last season. Obviously, there were no fans there. But all white at MetLife in the in the daylight is a really good look. All right. I, I, I think this is going to be a loud MetLife crowd. I think I think you're right. Like maybe losing week one may have taken some of the juice out of it a little bit. But I think if, if the Jets can get rolling early, especially with a few nice Zach Wilson plays, um, I think you're going to see the crowd really into this one. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I think this is a statement game for Robert Sala's Jets. Beat Bill Belichick, you know, right off the bat in your tenure. Doesn't matter if you lose the next two, but if you beat Bill Belichick, you'll buy yourself uh, a lot of goodwill in this city. So I think this is a statement game, and I think the team comes out ready to play. All right, everybody, enjoy your weekend. Have fun. Go Jets.